So good morning everybody. It's lovely to be back with everyone again online. Although I have to say after being open for 14 Sundays, it's actually come as more of a shock the church is closing this time than it almost was the first time. I really enjoyed each Sunday and each occasion that we met together over the weeks that we were open. And I pray of course that it won't be very long until we'll be open and able to join again physically in our buildings. But until then, we are back online from this Sunday, the 1st of November, right through until we are open again and even beyond, we will be back with our online services via YouTube. We're in Lurgan Parish Church this morning for the first Sunday in November, the fourth Sunday before Advent. So I'm going to uh, give you into Andy's hands. Andy will be leading the service and I will be preaching during the service. It is so good to be here, and I am so appreciative of the, of the opportunity to be here. And it is a place where, really, I can feel at home with all of the people of these, this group of parishes here. But our service today, and I think every day as we meet together in this online setting, is going to be available for you on the screen. So uh, with the hymns and with the psalm and with the other things, you'll be able to follow along and even, and even speak along. And if you want to follow in your in your prayer books, if you're at home and you have a prayer book or your hymnal, Thanks and Praise, what the first hymn, for example, today will be coming from Thanks and Praise and the others from the church hymnal, but you can certainly follow along there as well. And uh, it's going to be available, the service is going to be available across a variety of media. So that's, that's very, very good. So we'll begin our service with our call to worship. We are invited to share in Christ's ministry of compassion. We will widen our hearts so we might pray for the lost. We are challenged to learn more about God each day. We will open our minds so we might discern God's dream for us. We are summoned to let the Spirit be planted within us. We will deepen our souls so we might grow in love. And our opening hymn is hymn number 28 from Thanks and Praise. Come, thou font of every blessing. <laughs>
Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I'm going to hand you over for our Euro sermon, our children's sermon. Well, one of the things that you might notice is slightly different at this point is that I've got a box with me. Now, this box isn't the Euro sermon in itself. Over the weeks that uh, Phyllis School was open, um, I was going in every couple of weeks to do an assembly. It's been very different. So thankful for the staff how they've worked so hard in the school to keep it a, a safe environment and to see the smiles uh, and the energy of our kids. But we're not able to gather uh, for one assembly, so I have been safely hand washing and all of that, safe distance going through the four classrooms. And I've been bringing something in, in a box to get the kids to guess what's inside the box. And they said that I should name the box. And so we threw a, around different names, the black box, the mystery box, the holy box, and all of that. So maybe if I can combine all the names, maybe it's the holy black mystery box or something like that. Maybe I'll have to work on the marketing of that. But uh, when I've gone into the school, I give it a bit of a shake, and they all have to guess what's inside. So what's inside the box today? And of course, the purpose of our Euro sermon is that it's something that I buy from one of the, 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 the shops like uh, Euro sermon or, or the Euro shop or, or deals and, and it's something that's ordinary and yet when we think about it it maybe helps us to learn or to think about God so what have I bought today well today I have bought and the picture hopefully will appear uh, on the screen here beside me when I get to the editing phase but today if you can see what's on the screen I have bought a pair of goggles. I don't know if it's the weather to wear goggles, but one of the things that I've been looking at recently is the fantastic new lakeshore that is down at the uh, centre of Virginia, down New Street, and down by the shore. And I've noticed over the last couple of weeks, now maybe it was there all summer, and I hadn't noticed it, but I've noticed that they have this new swimming platform just about maybe 20 or 30 meters out from the shore you can swim out you can stand on the platform and then you can use it to dive into the water it's probably not the time of year to do that but you can imagine on a lovely hot summer's day diving into the water and being cool uh, from the hot sun although now that i think of it i'm not sure i can remember too many hot summer days um, either but this is the kind of thing that you might bring with you if you wanted to swim. It's a pair of goggles. Let's open them up and let's have a, see how they fit. So, uh, Andy, do you, just, do you swim? I do. Do you swim? Yes. Swimming pool or lake? Well, I grew up in both. I, we have a swimming pool in the nearest town, and okay, when I couldn't get to town, I would swim in farm ponds. In farm ponds? Farm ponds. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a new one on me. Yes. I'm not sure that many of our farm ponds I'd want to be swimming in around here. Well, they can be pretty mucky. The they can be pretty mucky. Uh, we'll not say what kind of pretty mucky, but they can be pretty <laughs> mucky. You can fill in the gap. But anyway, if you were swimming, whether it's in a swimming pool or whether it's in a farm pond somewhere, then you might wear one of these. Now, I don't know if I wear this. I think my head might be too big. Hold on. There we go. That might make it a bit bigger. Should have done this beforehand, shouldn't I? But to make swimming better, I don't think I'm going to be able to put these on. 
think I'm going to have to straight. Oh, no, hold on. There we go. That's it. That's it. So the idea of the swimming goggles is that when you're in water, you put them on and they cling to your eyes. Oh, this is sore. And it means when you dive into the water, you can... Yeah, that's a prompt. You can... Oh, see where you're going. Oh, there you go. Thank you. I'm glad Andy's listening. That would have been a little black mark there on the report. Oh, no, he doesn't listen very well. <laughs> but you can dive into the water, whether it's a swimming pool or whether it's in the lake. And when you dive in, you can see where you are swimming. More than that, maybe in the lake, you can see all of those little fishes there. Or in the swimming pool, if you're in a race, you can see the lines that you've got to follow so that you don't bump into the wall. So goggles can be handy. They can help you to see where you are going. If you don't have them on, it's much harder to see. It's kind of like swimming in, in the shadows, isn't it? It's much harder to see. So what might that help us think about the Christian faith? Or to think about God in the faith? Well, the Bible is full of all sorts of descriptions of God. And one of the things that God has given us is the Bible itself as a way of helping us understand God and as a way of understanding life. I heard someone say that Bible stood for basic instructions before leaving earth. It's kind of like a, an instruction manual that we have that helps us to see life through God's eyes. And for me, when I thought of the, the goggles, I suppose it reminded me that when we have a faith in God through Jesus, when we're a friend of Jesus, that it's like having these special goggles on, holy goggles on, although goggles with holes wouldn't be very good, but holy goggles on that help us to understand and to guide us through life, know that through God's eyes that life can be seen very differently. So that's why I bought the goggles today. And of course, the Bible challenges in our life that we should seek out God, that we should see God in our lives and ask God to be a friend of ours who journeys with us through life. So that's why I brought the goggles today. And we're going to join together in a song that reminds us that we should seek out God, that we should see God in our lives and we should follow him every day and in everything we do. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness.
make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Amen. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 107. It's, uh, it's split, it's broken between two sections, verses 1 through 7, and then verses 33 to 37. If you were following at home with your Book of Common Prayer, you would find this on page 719. Uh, we will read it uh, between uh, ourselves here today by alternate verse. And so if you wanted to come in on the alternate verse at home, please feel free to do that. So our psalm, Psalm 107. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is gracious, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those he redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And gather out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some went astray in desert wastes and found no path to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul was fainting within them. So they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He set their foot on the right way till they came to a city to dwell in. And then we pick up in verse 33. The Lord turns rivers into wilderness and water springs into thirsty ground. A fruitful land he makes a salty waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell there. He makes the wilderness a pool of water and water springs out of the thirsty land. There he settles the hungry, and they build a city to dwell in. They sow fields and plant vineyards, and bring in a fruitful harvest. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. It's time for our first reading. Hi, good morning everybody. This is Faith Sitole from the Virginia Group of Parishes. Today I'm going to read to you from the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter in Matthew, verses 1 to 2 and following on to verse 6. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and began to teach them. He said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I speak in the name of the one true and living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Before our church is closed again, sadly, in the middle of October, we, if you are part of the parish and can cast your mind back a few weeks, were spending time in Matthew's Gospel, specifically in the beginning of the greatest sermon arguably ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. It's recorded in Matthew 5, 6 and 7. And Jesus is literally on a mountainside in northern Israel, and he is teaching those who are gathered. And over three chapters, Jesus sets out some Christian teachings and a blueprint for a different way of living, modeled, of course, by Jesus himself. That's always the call of the Christian faith, to a different way of living that God says is better than any normal way that we might live in the world then and in the world of today. But in terms of this sermon series, we were looking at the opening 10 or so verses from Matthew 5. It's called the Beatitudes, and they are eight almost individual phrases that Jesus shared with his followers, those who are listening, those who are weighing up this call to a different way of living that Jesus offered. And Jesus encourages 
followers then, believers now, to live out these Beatitudes, this different way of living to the norm of the world, which will add a deeper blessing and enrichment to lives. And as we've engaged with each one, we've looked at three so far, we are, as we seek to apply them in our lives, looking at each of these Beatitudes through the experience of living through this time of pandemic. How each one might help or speak into the challenges and the difficulties, the opportunities indeed, we are facing in our personal lives and in the lives of communities and nations. Well, today we move on to Matthew 5, verse 6, that we heard a few moments ago. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled, Jesus says. When it comes to eating properly, hungering and thirsting, well, I'm pretty good. First thing in the morning, thirsting after a decent cup of coffee. Throughout the day, hungering and thirsting in fairly healthy ways. Well, that's, it. that's until it comes to the evening time. Do you know when the day's work is done? When you're kind of weary? Well, it's lovely to sit on the couch and just to watch television. Now, I don't know, this is just a psychological thing, but as soon as I sit down and start to watch a bit of television in the evening, the cravings kick in. Where are the crisps? Where is the chocolate? What bickies do we have in the house? And then I go on the hunt. I go searching. Now, I try to limit that during the week and to leave it to a Saturday evening for all of that, but I fail miserably. And I look at the cupboards, and I look in the drawers, and then if I can't find anything, the conversation in our house usually goes something like this. Vida, have you anything nice hidden away? Maybe your house has to be the same. And then Vida usually goes off, I'm not allowed nowhere. And she reappears back from one of her hidden goody places with a bar of chocolate or a packet of crisps or something to keep my cravings at bay. Until the next time. So what might this verse, as we think of that introduction, teach us about hungering and thirsting? And how might we apply it? Well, as I've said before, I don't have the ability to read the words of Jesus in the original language. I shared on another occasion, Andy, that when I was in the theological college, if you were 25 or older, you didn't have to study Hebrew or Greek. If you were 25 or younger, you had to. And at the end of my very first term in the college, I turned 25. And so for me, Greek and Hebrew were left behind. And I do genuinely, in part, regret that. Although I have to admit, I don't have an ear or a gift of languages. But with some of the can go back to the original language, Hebrew and Greek, Aramaic even, and to see the words in the different and original language, the understanding is in a much deeper way. So I have to rely on others to translate for me the original words that Jesus uses to demonstrate what he is saying. So looking at those who've done that translation, the original word hunger means something about desiring earnestly, craving ardently, and seeking with eager desire is what that original word in Greek meant. Whilst thirst that Jesus talks about means suffering from thirst to the point of almost feeling painfully thirsty or parched or eagerly longing for something. Earnestly, ardently, eagerly, longing. Of course, there are many other things 
that we desire, that we hunger and thirst after beyond food, aren't there? We desire companionship. We desire security. We desire safety and we desire friends and love. We desire accomplishment. We desire money and much more in the everyday things of life. And we look for many ways and we are motivated in many ways to fulfill that hungering and thirsting for these things. Good, bad and indifferent. To bring that satisfaction to our lives, don't we? To fulfill our human and natural cravings. And many of these things, as we know, have been taken away from us during this awful year, this challenging year, and we feel that void deeply in our lives. It challenges us to our core. We are lonely. We are struggling mentally and physically and emotionally. Many across our land struggling financially and in many other ways, and it's very real. Our personal world and our actual world, land and our communities have been turned upside down. And if that describes you today, as it describes me, I am struggling with everyone else to get through the challenges of all of this, then I think this passage has something to say to us. How we find some contentment beyond all those places that we normally would look. You see, at the very heart of this verse, and we have to go on a little journey to get back to the heart of the, pa uh, the passage, there is a key word that unlocks something powerful about what Jesus is saying to us. It's important to hear it, to know it, to grasp it, and I pray even to understand it. And the word that is at the very heart of this passage is the word righteousness. Again, going back to the original word is important. It translates into English that craving or looking after holiness, being blameless and pure, being made right with, of good standing, of justice. It almost sounds very legal, doesn't it? But it's not. And as we unpick the word righteousness, for me at least, it conveys, conveys something to us about God. The word conveys how we see ourselves with honesty, how we see God, but most importantly, it conveys to us how God sees us. We know from reading the scriptures that God, that Jesus, is perfect in every way, without sin. We know right through the pages of scripture that God desires and God calls us, God creates us, us to be in relationship with him. And that's good. That's beautiful. But the problem is that when we look at things from our perspective, we quickly realize that we are anything but perfect. We quickly realize that our relationship with God is anything but perfect. We fail God. We sin against God. We let God down and so on. We even wonder why God would want to bother with us at all. And this verse begins to ask the question, so how then can we relate to God? Indeed, how can we have a relationship where we even begin to hunger and thirst after God? And of course, we know what happens the rest of the story of Jesus. We know, or we should know, that the answer is the cross. The relationship between us and God 
is open because of the cross. It is made possible because of Jesus and his work on the cross to bring us back to God forgiven. Now, I want you to note what I've said there. I've said the words made possible. You see, therein is the challenge of this verse. You see, it tells us on the back end of the verse that we can have a relationship with the living God. That's what Jesus is pointing us to, hungering and thirsting after our relationship with the living God. A God who is alive. We can have a relationship with a God who is interested in the details of all of our lives and loves us. Now, in this moment today, we can have that relationship with God. In the here and now, we can experience God. But sometimes there is a difference between knowing that and actually putting that into reality. You see, I think what Jesus is getting at in all of these Beatitudes and in this verse is that for that relationship to be meaningful, it has to be an earnest choice that we make. A choice of heart and mind. One in which God becomes our prime focus. One in which we desire God openly, where we crave God, where we thirst after God, where we are eager for God, where we know in this moment our need of God, where we turn to God, where we reach out to God, where we are hungry for God, one in which we are made right by God, holy by God. And that's a whole different level. A whole different understanding when Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's that moment in our lives where we know that we need to turn to God and to accept his invitation to follow him and to come closer. And it's in that moment something deep happens. When we hunger and thirst after God, truly, sincerely, Jesus says, we will be filled. We will be satisfied beyond anything that we can imagine or experience in an earthly sense. So for me, this verse is an invitation to turn to God, to seek God out above all else and to keep doing that every day. Whatever a day or a season holds in our lives, just like each day we hunger and thirst for food which sustains us. That in a deeper spiritual sense we hunger and thirst for the living God equally who sustains us. And the frustrating thing from God's perspective is that he offers all of that. But we often spend the energy of our lives looking for that satisfaction somewhere else when the answer is right there before us. Blaise Pascal, a 16th century French innovator and theologian among many other things, sums it up very well. He says we all have a God-shaped void within us in our lives. All are hungry and thirsty. The problem is that we try to fill that emptiness, that hunger with other things than the righteousness of God. The assurance of God, in my words, the love of God, the mercy of God, the promises of God, the Holy Spirit of God. So in this great verse of hope is contained much. Jesus paints a picture that we can all understand, craving something. But he's not talking about the cravings we show when we are seeking earthly satisfaction. He is talking about our deep desires beyond things, being focused not on what brings satisfaction in this world, which sadly, as we've seen, can change and disappear in the blink of an eye, 
but focusing on God above all else, hungering and thirsting earnestly, ardently, eagerly above all else, after the one who promises forgiveness and a deeper satisfaction than anything the world offers, even in this time of pandemic. So let me finish with an honest question for each of us to reflect on, for me to reflect on. If we are honest, what are we hungering and thirsting after in our lives? And I don't mean that just in a food sense. What are the things that drive us to seek that satisfaction in life? What is that quick fix that we turn to? And what difference would it make if we switched our focus and hungered and thirsted after God alone to truly satisfy us completely? So today we are invited to turn to him with the words of Jesus in this fourth beatitude that says we will be blessed when we hunger and thirst, or thirst for righteousness, for the things of God, for they will fill us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are in a difficult moment where physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, we are challenged and even empty. And I pray that the words of this beatitude would bring us to a place where we can draw upon, feed upon, drink upon the one who fills us deeply in a way that we cannot experience or have in this worldly life. I pray that we would turn to Jesus afresh, that through him, through the living God, through the Holy Spirit, that we would experience God today in a new and real way, and that we would be filled and sustained by him every day. And I speak these words to the praise, glory, and honour of God alone. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 606, As the Deer Pants for the Water.
day of the Apostles' Creed. Together we begin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us present ourselves in an attitude Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide and defend our rulers, and grant our government wisdom. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness, and let your servants shout for joy. O Lord, save your people, and bless those whom you have chosen. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and let your glory be over all the earth. O God, may clean our hearts within us, and renew us by your Holy Spirit. And our collect of the day, the fourth Sunday before Advent. Almighty and eternal God, you have kindled the flame of love in the hearts of the saints. Give to us the same faith and power of love, that as we rejoice in their triumphs, we may be sustained by their example and fellowship through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in our prayers of intercession, the response to Lord in your mercy is hear our prayer. Father, as we come to you, we pray, Lord God, that you will help us, that you will hear our prayer, that you will guide us, that you will change us. We pray, Lord God, that you will help us to live out lives that bless and enrich the world. To live lives with you at the center instead of all of those other things which seem to distract us, to trouble us, and drain us of life, joy, and leave us empty. We pray, Lord, that you will help us live lives in submission to you and your word, filled with knowledge of your love and your life. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Father, help us to trust in you. Help us in this time especially to be able to put fear and despair behind us. Help us, Lord, so that in this time where we are needed the most by our family, our neighbors, our friends, and by others around us, to show the faith that we have in you by how we live out our lives, particularly lives of service, meeting the needs of others, putting the concerns of ourselves behind us, and looking, Lord God, to be your light, your salt, wherever we go. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We know, Father, that these are difficult times. We know that we are surrounded, Lord, with, with problems and trials and troubles. We know that your people, Lord God, have needs that are found difficult to be met because of separation from families, because of the lack of work, because of financial problems, because of strains on relationships, because our minds are ill at ease and troubled because our hearts, Lord, are filled with doubt, perhaps anger, frustration, and fear. Lord, we need you. We know, Lord God, our land needs you. We pray, Lord God, that you will respond to this, respond to your people. We pray, Lord God, that you will bring healing, 
that you will bring peace and that you will bring a sense of cooperation knowing more God that you are with us throughout this time wherever it goes Lord in your mercy hear our prayer Father we pray for those who have been bereaved either by complications of the coronavirus or by other things we pray Lord God that you would give them in this time your peace and your comfort. And even though they cannot surround themselves as they would like to with friends and with family, we pray, Lord God, that they still will be comforted by the prayers of your people and by the presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord God, for those who are ill, at home or in the care of others. We pray, Lord God, for your mercy upon them. We pray, Lord God, for strength and grace. We pray, Lord God, for healing. We pray, Lord, where healing is not to come, that you will show, Lord God, your love in other ways, in their lives and through the people around them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, we pray for each other. We have so many needs that are known sometimes only to ourselves and to you. And of these things, Lord God, that trouble us and weigh upon us, we lift them now together silently to you in prayer. our prayer. And Father, in this new month, we are aware, Lord, that we are in a great big world. That there are things going on in other countries and other places that sometimes are far more troubling than our own. But we also know that the coronavirus itself is felt much heavier in other places. And so, Lord God, we thank of churches around the world where your people are struggling with this and other things. Countries in Africa, in Eastern Europe, in the Middle East, the UK, and particularly in the United States as it approaches an election time. And we pray for the divisions there. We pray for our own country. And we pray, Lord, for our own church here, that our church, Lord, would be a witness for you to your people in this time. We pray, Lord God, for this new week. We pray, Lord God, that as we go out from here, out from our homes, Lord, and into the world, whether it be for a five-kilometer walk, or whether we are able to return to work, or to go and shop, or to go out to care for the needs of our neighbors, we pray, Lord God, that you will go with us, that you will guide us and direct us in all that we do, and help us, Lord, always to be your light in your soul. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our, our Savior, Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. We we'll draw our prayers together in the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. We close our time of prayer together with the saying of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.
As we come to our closing hymn, I want to say uh, thank you to, to Craig for his words to us today, and especially for his allowing me to be here to share this time and the time over this next 10 weeks with him and with you. I am sure that it is a time that will be very helpful to me in my own formation and one where in turn I hope that I can be a blessing to you. Our final hymn is hymn number 24, All Creatures of Our God and King.
And so as we've joined together, as we have worshipped together, as we've prayed together, as we've gathered around God's word together, even though our worlds are limited, we still within our own spheres of influence, our five kilometer spheres, our neighbours, our friends, our family, are sent out to love and to serve the Lord in whatever way that we can. And so we have this part of our service where we are sent out to bring our faith beyond these doors, to bring our faith beyond this digital world, as we say, and now go forth, to love God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. With passion, with prayer, with intelligence. Go forth to love your neighbour. With forgiveness, with service, with love. Go forth to love God and to love yourself. With hope, with joy, with peace. And as we journey forth, we know that God is with us. When we hunger and thirst after him, he is with us in every place that we find ourselves, in every moment, in every situation of life. And I pray God's blessing would be very real to us today on the lives of those that we pray for and we carry in our hearts each day. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us now and always. Amen. And so we go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Have a good week. And next Sunday, as we gather again in one of our other churches, we will be gathering for another uh, important mark in our church year, and that is for Remembrance Sunday. And uh, Andy will be preaching and sharing with us next week. Until then, God bless and have a good week.